Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, for those uh, who may be visitors from outside, I'm Subra Suresh, president of Carnegie Mellon University. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to the Privacy Day events on campus. Let me first start by thanking our faculty colleagues, Lori Craner, Norman Sade, Alessandro Acquisti, and Farnam Jahanian for all their efforts in putting together this program and for their participation. We are dealing with an issue that is very significant, very urgent on a national scale and on a global scale. It is borderless. It's an area where Carnegie Mellon University has enormous leadership. One of the remarkable things about technology is that every time there is a wonderful new technology, there are many intended applications of the technology and it advances intentionally quality of life. With every intended consequence, there are many unintended consequence, consequences. With every use, a valid, legal, justifiable use, there are many abuses, sometimes unintentionally and sometimes intentionally. And cybersecurity and issues associated with privacy as technology interacts with human behavior is no different. The information systems that underpin our national and world economy also make us extremely vulnerable to cyber criminals, cyber terrorists, whose location and identity may not be known. And this affects every part of our lives communications, finance, energy, transportation network, healthcare, retail stores, credit card transactions, agencies of government. As a former head of a federal agency, I knew that my agency was attacked and I had to um, immediately put in place actions but those actions to prevent cyber terrorism have unintended consequences. They slow down communication, which frustrates people. So human behavior and uh, technology intersected in some very interesting ways. Even universities with renowned cybersecurity programs have been attacked, and we see that all the time. And I'm not gonna say whether CMU is one of them or not. So the de devices we carry connect us to the world and they are in that place as well. So this challenge calls for collective thinking, innovative thinking, and fresh approaches that not only take the latest in technology and staying ahead, at least one step ahead of those whose intentions are not completely honorable, but at the same time, making sure that how we use the technology, either for preventive measures or proactive measures, it doesn't come in the way of uh, quality of human quality of life. I think that's the challenge. So the intersection of technology and human condition, that's an area where Carnegie Mellon is a world leader as well, how technology impacts human condition. One example of Carnegie Mellon's innovative thinking about privacy is our unique privacy engineering master's program. This is the only graduate program, to my knowledge, in the world that is dedicated to training computer scientists and engineers for careers designing privacy into future products and services. So Carnegie Mellon has led the world in addressing cybersecurity and privacy needs for many decades. We have well-established entities on campus, such as Scilab, Software Engineering Institute, of course, different schools and colleges, School of Computer Science, College of Engineering, Mellon College of Science, Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Heinz College, Tepper School. Uh, issues of privacy have been topics of research and education for a long period of time. Ever since Sony Pictures was hacked a few weeks ago, even our College of Fine Arts has to pay attention to this. 
moving forward in the future. So Carnegie Mellon, and, and it's no longer a military issue, a defense issue, it's a commercial issue, it's a human issue. And this is something with our various policy arms on campus we have to pay attention to. Two weeks ago, President Obama spoke at the Federal Trade Commission about new measures he is taking to protect Americans uh, and their data privacy. One of the reasons he was there was due to the work of our keynote speaker today, Julie Brill, who's the commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. Commissioner Brill, Brill has been called one of Washington's most important voices on internet privacy and data security. Before being named, before being nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate to lead the Federal Trade Commission, we were just talking about the fun process of going through Senate confirmation, which both of us did in 2010. Ms. Brill was Senior Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Consumer Protection and Antitrust for the North Carolina Department of Justice and had served in a similar role in Vermont for more than 20 years. She's a graduate of Princeton University and New York University Law School and has taught on the faculty at Columbia Law School. Commissioner Brill recognizes the many potential benefits our information systems bring us, and she argues that they depend crucially on public confidence and trust. And building public trust is one of the key challenges in both protecting our cyberspace and protecting the quality of life. And I think uh, she brings an enormous uh, record of experience, talent, um, and perspective to her current position. As she has noted, the most promising technological solutions to the challenging privacy problems facing us today will result from working closely with scientific and engineering communities such as ours. So please joining me in both extending our sincere appreciation to Commissioner Brill and to welcoming her to give her keynote address. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here and uh, to just be at one of the nation's absolutely most extraordinary and unique uh, scientific and engineering universities. Um, I've spent the morning talking to some professors and some students and I can tell you that I was actually blown away by every conversation I've had, so it's been really remarkable. Um, thank you, President Suresh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Lori, Dr. Craner, um, for inviting me to speak here uh, today. Um, it's really great to be at Carnegie Mellon when you think about it. This university has had a hand in shaping so many of our leaders in technology and science. I recently learned, for instance, that there have been a remarkable 12 Turing Award winners who have uh, been on faculty or come through here. That's pretty impressive. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about the Internet of Things today, and when I think about it, it's also an incredible pleasure to be doing that here, because here are where the engineers and computer scientists who already are, or will soon be, colonizing that astonishing world. Just gonna, there we go. It's getting real. <laughs> I was lucky enough to attend the Consumer Electronics Show in uh, Las Vegas at the very beginning of this month. And I was bowled over by the products that were on display. And actually, I mean that quite literally. Um, one of a pair of synchronized drones, dancing drones, that I was watching crashed uh, mid-pirouette. Um, it was still a supremely impressive and somewhat uh, strangely beautiful demonstration, although you might have wanted to have brought a hard hat with you to watch it. Um, but the connected devices, really remarkable. I uh, finished up my 2015 uh, Christmas shopping 11 months early. Um, I uh, was completely wowed by the Swarovski pendants and bracelets that double as health monitors, smart cars that steer you out of trouble before you even know that you're in it, sprinklers that conserve water, 
uh, front doorbells that send a video to you of the visitor who's at your door so you can decide whether you want to open it or not. Garages that alert you when your teenager has left the door open, once again. And outdoor grills that will text you when it's time to turn the meat. Now, for the vegetarians in the audience, that may not make such a difference, but for fair weather meat eaters like me, um, and you ha if you happen to be married to someone who doesn't really know the difference between rare and you know well done, that's actually a huge improvement. And um, I think it was, it's something that I'm definitely gonna look into. Okay. The benefits that we might draw from the Internet of Things are real and significant. Convenience is just one of them. Besides making our lives easier and more entertaining, connected devices will give us tremendous insights through data, lots of data. Six years ago, for the first time, the number of things connected to the internet surpassed the number of people connected to the internet. The amount of data in the world um, has already been doubling every two years. Experts estimate that as of this year, there will be 25 billion connected devices. And by the year 2020, there will be 50 billion. The data that we collect from the Internet of Things and the insights that we draw from this data could help solve some of the big challenges that we face as a society. In the hands of scientists and analysts, data from sensors in our cars, in our homes, and on our wrists could help us find ways to use energy more efficiently, avoid traffic jams, and stay healthier, longer, and with less expense. Public health emergencies, from the flu to Ebola, will be predicted and managed with information from big data crunching computer algorithms. So what's the catch? Well, much of this data will be deeply personal and will say a great deal about us as individuals. We already know that every time we swipe our smartphone screens to check Twitter or tap phones to pay for coffee, we add to the swelling rivers of data that capture the details of what we do, what we buy, what we read, and where we go. Soon these streams of data will reveal whether we're at home and what we're doing there. They will record how much we've exercised, when we've gained a few pounds, and as uh, Dr. Suresh and I were talking about a little while ago, they will also dis record how well we sleep. They'll log our vital signs and help us manage our diabetes, our heart, and other health conditions. Now at the same time, as Google's chairman, Eric Schmidt, reportedly uh, said last week at Davos, the internet will disappear. That is, we'll all carry, wear, sit next to, and use so many devices that, that are connected all the time that the idea of a network connection will become an anachronism. Just as you forget about shifting gears in your car once you have an automatic transmission, Schmidt predicts that you will forget about devices being in a connected state connectivity will be just a part of the way that things work. We are on the threshold of the age of omniscience, when everyone can know everything about everyone and share that knowledge in real time with everyone else over our omnipresent devices. The burgeoning Internet of Things is our entryway. Some say we should stride through, Confident that the future is bright, a golden one. But what about privacy? What about concerns regarding how this deeply personal information will be used to form rich portraits of each of us? Many have looked at the increasing numbers of connected devices and the corresponding explosion in the amount of data we have and have concluded that privacy is dead. Others have taken a slightly different angle and st have stated that the privacy principles that the Federal Trade Commission and many agencies, companies, and advocates support, these principles need to be abandoned and replaced with a different framework. I could not disagree more. It is certainly true that the Internet of Things, big data, and new forms of analytics 
all challenge traditional privacy principles. The challenges at the top of the list are data security, the collection and use of sensitive information, and the fair and ethical use of information. However, as our report on the Internet of Things, which was issued just yesterday, makes clear, the right response for regulators, companies, technologists, and advocates is to figure out not whether, but how to address these challenges in the always-on, massively connected world that we are developing. In order to fully reap the benefits of the Internet of Things and big data, both must be imbued with tested principles of privacy. Now, I believe we can unlock the potential of big data and enjoy its benefits while still obeying the privacy principles that protect individuals, the same principles that we at the Federal Trade Commission have championed for many years through a combination of law enforcement and policy development. Finding solutions that honor privacy principles will be important, and not just to the FTC, and not just to the consumers that we protect. It will also be critical to companies who know that they need to maintain consumers' trust if they're gonna win their loyalty and their business. This alignment creates an opportunity for you in this audience today. Now, some of you are today's leading engineers, leading engineering professors, company chief technology officers, and computer scientists. And others of you are studying to fill those roles in the not-too-distant future. You understand that technology like this brings challenges, and I believe you are passionate about finding solutions. You have the skills that are necessary to find out when systems are unreasonably vulnerable to security breaches or are picking up more information than they need for their expected purpose. You have the ability to think about whether algorithms might be treating some consumers in an unfair or an exclusionary manner. And just as importantly, you have the ability to do better, to do much better by designing privacy, security, and fairness into the Internet of Things from the very beginning. So let me begin with data security. Data security has been a priority of the Federal Trade Commission for more than a decade. The FTC has obtained more than 50 consent orders against companies that, in our view, misrepresented how good their security was or failed to take reasonable measures to protect consumer data. Our initial enforcement efforts focused on financial harms that consumers could suffer when their social security numbers or information about their credit cards or bank accounts fell into the wrong hands. But we've also focused on security lapses that harmed consumers in other ways. For instance, by disclosing medical information, pharmaceutical records, and information about our families, our location, or our activities in our homes. Moreover, reasonable security, reasonable data security, is essential to privacy. Put simply, there is no privacy without appropriate data security. Several of our recent cases, I think, drive home this point in particular, the connection between appropriate data security and privacy. So let's consider for a moment one of the cases we recently did involving uh, the mobile app Snapchat. We alleged that Snapchat deceived consumers by representing that the messages consumers sent through the app would, after a few seconds, disappear forever. However, the Snapchat app was vulnerable in ways that allowed the recipient of the message to bypass the app's security and permanently store messages. Now, even if you're not a Snapchat user, and I have a feeling that many of you are, but even if you're not, you can imagine that a security failure that leads to the capture of an image that you thought would be ephemeral is a pretty rude shock and undermines a central selling point privacy enhancement that Snapchat was offering. 
Similarly, consider our cases against Credit Karma and Fandango. We alleged that these apps were vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks, in which a hacker could pose as a legitimate data recipient and collect highly sensitive information, such as credit card details, credit report data, that's information in your credit report, and social security numbers. Credit Karma and Fandango are now, as a result of orders that we have entered into with them, both prohibited from misrepresenting the privacy and security of their products, and they are required to establish comprehensive programs designed to address security risks. Now, some companies trade in other types of highly sensitive information. For example, debt brokers are entities that buy information about consumers who have unpaid debts and sell them to debt collectors. Debt, por debt portfolios not only list debtors by name and thus reveal who has an unpaid debt, which in and of itself could be sensitive information is, and is considered such under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, but these portfolios may also contain full bank account numbers and other sensitive financial information. Last year, at the very end of last year, the Federal Trade Commission sued two debt brokers for posting debt portfolios containing information about tens of thousands of consumers on public, publicly accessible websites, free for anyone to download. We alleged that this disclosure of consumer information was unfair. And the first data security case that the FTC brought involving the Internet of Things also raised privacy concerns. In this case, we allege that the defendant company's internet-connected cameras were vulnerable to having their feeds hijacked. And indeed, around 700 private video feeds, some of which included images of kids in their homes or people just going about their daily activities in their homes, these feeds were hacked and publicly posted as a result of the company's alleged lax security practices. Now, Part of the solution of these data security issues will be enacting new laws. As um, uh, President Suresh mentioned, President Obama visited the Federal Trade Commission just two weeks ago. And while there, he called on Congress to enact strong, flexible, and technology neutral federal legislation to strengthen the FTC's existing data security enforcement tools and to provide notification to consumers when there is a security breach. We at the FTC have long been calling for um, a federal uh, data security law, and we most recently reiterated this call in the new report that we just issued on the Internet of Things. General data security legislation, including the authority for us to issue rules and seek civil penalties from companies that violate the law, should protect against unauthorized access to personal information and should also protect device functionality itself. This latter issue, the protection of device functionality, could become an issue if, for example, a device like a pacemaker is hacked, a case in which both health, health information could be compromised and the person wearing the device could be seriously harmed. Now, while legislation and FTC enforcement are actions, are, are important responses to the data security threats posed by the expanding Internet of Things, the first line of defense will be the actions that companies need to take to secure their connected devices, as well as the data gathered, compiled, and shared through the Internet of Things. It's you the technologists and engineers designing the next generation of connected devices. It is you who we must count on to protect security by pumping it into the very heart of these products. It's not gonna be easy, and frankly, we have a long way to go. A recent study by Hewlett Packard found that 90% of connected devices are collecting personal information and 70% of them are transmitting this data without encryption. To me, those numbers are astonishing. 
traditional consumer goods manufacturers who are entering the Internet of Things, um, unlike many more established technology firms, have not spent decades thinking about how to secure their products and services from hackers. Furthermore, furthermore the small size and lightweight of many connected devices could inhibit encryption and other robust security measures. Some connected devices will be cheap and essentially disposable with limited computing power. If a vulnerability is discovered on such a device, it may be difficult from both an engineering and an economic perspective for the manufacturer to update the software or provide a patch or to get the news of such a fix to consumers. The Internet of Things report advises that companies adopt a policy of security by design, writing security into their products at the outset rather than as an afterthought. Technologists working on new devices should perform initial security risk assessments, test services for security flaws before they go to market, continuously monitor products through the life cycle, and to the extent possible, patch known vulnerabilities. Companies should train all employees about good security, implement reasonable access control measures to limit the ability of an un unauthorized person within the company to access a consumer's device, data, or the consumer's network, and ensure that security issues are addressed at the appropriate level of responsibility within an organization. When companies identify significant risks within their systems, they should implement a defense in depth approach, implementing security measures at multiple levels. Now, of course, data minimization also plays a key role in promoting data security and privacy. You can't lose or misuse what you don't have. And for that reason, the FTC has long pushed companies to practice data minimization. We renew this call in our report on the Internet of Things, suggesting that companies limit the consumer data they collect and maintain to the information they truly need and dispose of information once they no longer need it. We also call on companies to de-identify the data that they do keep. From the FTC's perspective, effective de-identification combines reasonable technical de-identification with accountability measures that prohibit the company that controls the data from attempting to re-identify it and places the same prohibitions on any recipients of the de-identified data. We developed this proposal, this way of thinking about de-identification, both from a technological perspective as well as using accountability mechanisms as a direct result of some of the work that was done by um, Alessandro Quisti and others here at Carnegie Mellon. The role of technologists going forward is clear. You can help design the connected devices and apps that do the most with the least amount of personally linkable information and ensure that the devices and apps regularly flush their stores of unnecessary data. Let me turn to sensitive information, but first let me just take, give me one moment, sorry. The second privacy challenge coming from the Internet of Things is the collection and use of sensitive personal information. Now here in the United States, I believe we've reached a general consensus, which is reflected in HIPAA, our federal health privacy law, and elsewhere, that personal information about health is deeply sensitive. Its, it's inappropriate disclosure can cause severe embarrassment, harm an individual's job and other economic prospects, or reveal information even about family members. HIPAA mainly covers traditional healthcare providers and insurers. Yet some of the most exciting pr prospects for society changing innovations come from wearable devices and mobile apps that encourage consumers to collect and store their own health data, placing the information collected, some of it highly sensitive, outside the boundaries of current law. 
The prospects of employing user-generated health information from wearable devices and the like to solve healthcare and other societal problems in the near future are exciting. Yet some companies are putting this information, this sensitive health information, to more immediate and, shall we say, mundane uses. As the FTC staff recently reported, some mobile health apps transmit personal information to third parties, such as advertising networks and analytics companies. FTC staff reviewed 12 health-related mobile apps and found that they transmitted information some of it relating to sensitive uh, health conditions such as pregnancy, to 76 third parties. For example, one app transmitted health-related search terms such as ovulation and pregnancy to these third parties. In many instances, the third parties received information about consumers' workouts, their meals, and their diets, and this information was identified by the consumer's real name email address, or other unique and persistent identifiers. These third parties, again, the ad networks and others like that and analytics firms, could combine this information with other data from smart devices, including location, lifestyle, and consumption habits to generate additional sensitive inferences. Now, such surprisingly personal disclosures, I believe, are at odds with consumer trust. Yet I often hear that it is too difficult to put traditional privacy safeguards in place. Wearable fitness devices, for example, might not have a user interface to serve as a means to present consumers with a choice about data collection. Devices will become too numerous for consumers to manage their information. And that information is simply too valuable to consider deleting. So these arguments go. I believe these arguments often lead their proponents to the conclusion that the only feasible privacy safeguard for sensitive information generated through the Internet of Things will be through what are known as risk-based frameworks or use-based frameworks that focus exclusively on how sensitive data is actually used. Now, I think it's important that we break these arguments down and address them carefully. First, as to the argument that traditional privacy principles such as notice, choice, and data minimization are unrealistic to apply to the Internet of Things, I frequently urge companies to recognize that individual control and transparency for personal information is an enduring expectation and a much broader concept than simply permitting or refusing information collection at a single point in time. Connected devices are no different, but providing transparency and control will take some creative thinking. Immersive apps and websites should be employed to describe to consumers in meaningful ways and in relatively simple terms the nature of the information being collected and to provide consumers with choices about whether any of this information can be used by entities or persons that fall outside the context in which the consumer is employing the device and in which the consumer expects her information to remain private. Another promising tool and creative tool for providing consumers choice is the command center that companies are now developing to run multiple household connected devices. I saw a bunch of the command centers on display at the Consumer Electronics Show, and one really interesting thing is to see the competition among firms for developing the command center that's going to be the market leader. We can talk about that later. But the driving force to these command centers is convenience. Uh, now, while that's the driving force, they can also serve an appropriate, an appropriate tool and provide an opportunity for consumers to understand the information that their devices are generating and to control where that information is going. So after all, if you have a centralized interface that's gonna pr your, that a consumer will use to program their garage door, their thermostat, their television, their refrigerator, and everything else that they have that's connected in their home, the consumer ought to be able to use that very same interface to make meaningful choices about the data that their devices are gonna collect and where that data will go. Now second, 
I do believe it is quite helpful for companies to develop practices that examine how they use, uh, how they use data. So I believe that use-based frameworks and risk-based frameworks have an important place in developing appropriate privacy ap approaches to privacy and data security. But I don't believe that we can rely entirely on such use-based frameworks to protect consumers' privacy. A lack of transparency is one of the big drawbacks to a use-based model. Unless permissible uses have been specified in a way that's accessible to consumers, or frankly, to everyone, through legislation, for example, it's going to be difficult or impossible for consumers to understand what's happening with their data. Focusing solely on the risks and benefits of data uses could also lead companies to ignore the risks created by data collection and retention on their own, standing alone. One such risk is, risk is the vast amounts of data that companies will collect that will become a target for, hack for hackers. And the risk of harm to consumers from a security breach increases along with the amount and sensitivity of the data that the companies are storing. Another risk is that companies will collect lots of sensitive information about consumers or infer it from other data that they collect. So even if companies don't make further use of sensitive data, I believe that the mere collection or creation through inference is something that consumers will want to know about and will want to be able to control. Okay, let's go on to data brokers big data and use of fair use of data. Security and privacy are not the only challenges for policymakers and technologists that come from the Internet of Things. We at the FTC are also wrestling with questions raised by the ever-improving ability of algorithms to make inferences and predictions about us. These algorithms have been around in one guise or another for a long time, but their power will swell if the profiles that analytics companies generate grow richer with information from connected devices. Now, data brokers, which are firms that are unknown to most consumers, they collect and combine compendia of tens of thousands of bits of data about each of us and morph them into startlingly accurate profiles. When run through the big data mill, these data points can be woven together into predictions about personal behavior and characteristics. These profiles are quite valuable to the data broker's clients who want to know where we live, where we work, how much we earn, as well as our daily activities, both online and offline, and our interests. They want to know, are we gardeners? Are we shopping for a car? Maybe did we just have a baby? Are we, what kind of market are we in? But some of these profiles can also contain inferences about more sensitive attributes, such as our race, our health conditions, and our financial status. Data brokers may describe us as financially challenged or perhaps having a Bible lifestyle. They may place us in a category, and the things I'm about to talk about are real and have been discovered by um, not only the FTC in our reports, but other researchers. Some of the categories are things like diabetes interest or smoker in household. Some of them, some of the data brokers smell mark, sell marketing lists that identify consumers that have addictions or that have AIDS. Others focus on ethnicity and finances, creating consumer lists such as Metro Parents. Now this was a list that uh, uh, included single parents who are primarily high school or vocationally educated and are handling, quote, the stresses of urban life on a small budget. Another segment, th these profiles are called segments, uh, that we discovered was one called Timeless Traditions, which were immigrants who speak some English but generally prefer Spanish. Now, to see an example of how such targeting can be harmful in practice, Consider a case that we recently brought against a company called Leap Lab. In the complaint that we filed just last month, the commission alleged that Leap Lab sold information about consumers who applied for payday loans to two kinds of customers, 
About 5% of these applications, this payday loan information, went to bona fide lenders. The rest, which was obviously the vast majority of, these, of this information, went to non-lenders, some of whom used the information to commit fraud against these vulnerable or potentially vulnerable consumers. We alleged that these disclosures were unfair and illegal. Now, of course, in this case, Leap Lab knew that consumers were interested in payday loans. But other companies might just as well have created, through data analytics or based on a data broker's profile, a list of consumers who were likely interested in a payday loan. Now, I want to be clear. I believe that such a list or such groupings of consumers could be beneficial to consumers. For instance, a bank that might use such, a bank might use such a list to target their advertising for safe, low entry, low cost financial products to this, to this type of consumer because such consumers might be more likely to be unbanked or financially vulnerable. And this might be a good thing that banks can find a way to reach out to this type of consumer. But the difficulty is that the very same list, the very same type of information could just as easily be used by less scrupulous firms who want to target consumers with high cost, short term loans that could lead consumers into a cycle of debt. Both uses in some sense are marketing, but the outcome for consumers who receive the bank's ads could be quite different from those who receive ads from payday lenders or more unscrupulous firms. Now, I'm confident that many responsible companies will take a close look at whether their analysis of data and the use of rich profiles leads them to categorize consumers by race, ethnicity, or other sensitive cl classifications, or by proxies for such sensitive classifications. I think companies will also make ethics reviews part of their big data analytics business practices, and I believe that they should perhaps by creating consumer subject review boards to identify and reduce consumer risks, as one US privacy scholar has suggested. Computer and data scientists will play a crucial role in such ethics reviews by helping to determine whether specific analytics practices pose risks of excluding or otherwise placing at a disadvantage groups defined according to sensitive traits. But as I just noted, I don't think it's sufficient to rely solely on companies to decide whether certain classifications or the use of these classifications are good or bad. I believe baseline privacy legislation will help address many of these underlying issues. So too would data broker legislation, which could place some transparency, access, and correction requirements on data brokers as well as their sources of information and the clients that use their information. But there are steps that companies can and should take now without having any of this legislation enacted. Technologists who understand predictive analytics could make these steps even more meaningful. I'd like to see companies that are engaged in data analytics that generate sensitive information about consumers deploy greater resources and imagination to designing intuitive portals, dashboards, and better interfaces for consumers to use to control their privacy and security. Companies should provide consumers with creative tools that would give them the opportunity to understand their marketing profiles so the consumers could learn, could learn whether their race, health conditions, or financial status are part of their marketing profiles and could make meaningful choices about that could decide that they don't want to be marketed to based upon their race or their sexual orientation. And consumers should be able to learn about profiles used for more substantive decisions, like whether they are potentially risky customers, so, they, so that they, the consumers, can correct inaccuracies in such a profile that might lead to inappropriate conclusions and might lead them to lose opportunities in the marketplace. And computer engineers, you all, 
can play a critical role in designing such portals and other mechanisms for providing consumers with such meaningful information and control tools. I'm one of the lucky people in life who's had the great opportunity to spend a career doing what I love to do. I get to use the law to protect consumers, and I've done it for many, many years. But I have to admit, I am a bit jealous when I think about the careers that you have or that you're about to have. As technologists, algorithmists, CIOs, computer scientists, you are standing at the forefront of a social technological revolution that is changing and will continue to change our world in miraculous ways. Riding the wave of the Internet of Things and big data, you are ushering in the age of omniscience and, to a great extent, your work will determine whether this new age shines brightly or turns to black. Now, Fidel Castro once said, Revolution is a struggle to the death between the future and the past. Now, at the risk of throwing some cold water over our recent detente with, with Cuba, I actually would take issue with that quote. I believe the success of this revolution, your revolution of the Internet of Things, depends on the extent to which the technology of the future embraces the proven privacy principles of the past. As policymakers like me forge ahead to develop guidelines, best practices, and legislative recommendations on how to secure consumers' data and privacy in this age of omniscience, we need you to figure out how to wire security and privacy into the devices and algorithms that will define this new age. Engendering consumer trust in the Internet of Things will allow us all to realize its full potential. I'm confident that if we work together, we will achieve this goal. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Let's see. There's also one. Oh, there's one right next to you, perfect. Well, first of all, uh, uh, Commissioner Brown, thank you so much for your thoughtful remarks. Thank you for joining us today. I know we immensely enjoyed your presentation, but the day is not over yet. So first of all, there are two uh, microphones on each side of the room. We're gonna take a couple of questions from the audience before I invite my uh, colleagues, the fellow panelists, to join us uh, at the podium. So with that, questions. Just go to either side of the room. Did you wanna stand at the podium? Or? I, I, I'm happy to stand okay, no is this okay. Is this on? Or can we put it on? There we go. Thank you so much. Sir. Hi, my name is Pedro. I'm a privacy researcher here at CMU. My name is Pedro. I'm a privacy researcher at CMU. Uh, thanks for the, for the talk. It was great. It was very insightful and uh, obviously uh, very informative too. Uh, my question is, I actually have two questions, but my first question is uh, related to the multi-stakeholder process that was proposed by the White House in 2012. And I just want to know what your thoughts are uh, about the usefulness of that process for the forthcoming uh, privacy regulation that has been just proposed by the White House a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, uh, Obama is suggesting that comprehensive privacy regulation should you know, be passed and analyzed by the Congress. So what, what, what is the stakeholder process uh, feed there? So thanks for that question. Um, the the um, multi-stakeholder process, I think, does have a very useful place in all of privacy conversations. You know, you heard me talk about one of the problems with use-based, risk-based frameworks when they're not part of a public discussion. So I think it's very important for there be to be a public discussion, a public vetting of what it is that we think about when we think about privacy harms, just for instance. Um, so the first uh, uh, multi-stakeholder process that the NTIA, um, gosh, what is NTIA stand? National Telecommunications and Information Agency, did I get that right, NTIA? Something, close enough. Um, NTIA ran um, was with respect to disclosures in mobile apps, and um, that uh, process um, met with some mixed reviews, 
um, honestly. Um, some of the uh, principles that were developed and, and ideas that were being developed are, are supposedly being beta tested right now. And I think the jury's still out on, uh, on how successful it was. I know that the, co the discussion was very um, vehement and robust within the multi-stakeholder process for that issue. Um, there's now one underway with respect to facial recognition uh, and developing uh, some ideas around that. And I actually, are you involved in that, Alessandro? Have you been, have you spoken to them? I spoke with them. Yeah, we've also done a presentation. You know, we did a workshop on facial recognition where Alessandro came. And um, so we also do presentations at these workshops. In some ways, I think that one is a little bit of a smaller um, bite that they've, uh, to, to, to take, you know, they, it's, a, it's a more manageable topic in some ways. Um, also incredibly important to develop best practices. So um, I do think that, uh, that multi-stakeholder processes are really valuable in terms of developing best practices in developing rules that maybe haven't yet been written into law, but where companies and consumer advocates and regulators can agree that we can come, we can come together to develop best practices. So some of the success is going to depend on the issue that's chosen. Now, with respect to the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, that is undergoing a different kind of review. Uh, my understanding is the Commerce Department has taken a lot of comments on the last draft of the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. And frankly, one of the issues that I think Commerce is wrestling with, and I also think this issue is being wrestled with in Europe, I should add, um, is how do you address the very issues that I was talking about in my talk, how do you ensure that, you, that we're going to gain the benefits of the Internet of Things and of big data analytics without harming consumers? So I think that's some of what has been wrestled with. I think it's been more less of a public conversation at this point and more kind of happening at commerce, taking lots of comments, meeting with folks. And I think once a draft is launched, then there will be much more of a public conversation. I don't know if it will be similar to the multi-stakeholder process that NTIA has run in these other two topics, but I'm sure there will be a very robust conversation about it. Thank you for that question. Let's take a question from this side. Can sure. you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Please. Ron Bandes with the CERT program at Carnegie Mellon. Great. And I'm curious about the difference between your job and the jobs of your uh, uh, peers in Europe. Whereas in Europe, they have broad laws that say things like information about individuals belongs to the individuals, and in the United States, the information belongs to whoever collects it. Well, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into um, whether that's an accurate description of U.S. law because I actually am not certain that it is. Um, I I do think the issue in the U.S. is not ownership of information, but rather control. Um, I think an ownership conversation can be a difficult conversation. I spend a lot of time um, talking to my European colleagues. In fact, I was just in Europe and I did a big debate at a conference called Consumer Privacy and Data Protection with uh, Paul, Paul Nimitz. And we were debating kind of the, the pluses and minuses of EU versus US law. Um, so I'll do a very, very short version of, of my view on that. Um, but before I say that, let me, let me say I work very closely with the European Data Protection Authorities. I'm working and, and having uh, lots of discussions with the European uh, Commission, and in particular the Director General for Justice, which is um, working on the uh, proposed reg in Europe and trying to get that through, to talk about the ways in which U.S. privacy law actually works because there's a lot of misinformation in Europe about the way the US law actually works, and to talk about how it's different from European law, in that, you're right, it's not a black letter law, but we do do privacy, I believe, in a very robust way. Does that mean it's perfect? Absolutely not. That's why I believe we need data security legislation, I think we need data broker legislation, and I think we need a president, you know, the president's Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. But European law isn't perfect now either, and that's why they're proposing a proposed regulation which will um, bring together the different uh, member states' laws so it, they all come under one regulatory framework and also do things like a one-stop shop and, I should note, import some critical ideas that have developed here in the United States, like children's privacy 
like data breach and data security legislation, which Europe doesn't really have. So, um, you know, here in the U.S., the way we do privacy is we have sector-specific laws. For instance, I mentioned HIPAA in my talk, Graham Leach Bliley dealing with financial information, um, credit reporting law, very important law dealing with sensitive information that's used for making sensitive decisions about consumers in a financial or employment or insurance context. COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So we have some very protective laws in areas where Congress has identified the potential for real harms. And outside of those silos, if you will, we have the Federal Trade Commission Act, and we have state mini FTC laws, which say that unfair and deceptive acts and practices are not allowed. And it's in that context, between the silos, that we at the Federal Trade Commission step in and do our enforcement work. And we do bring cases not just where companies make a claim about their practices and then fail to live up to their claim, but our unfairness jurisdiction allows us to focus in on issues where consumers are harmed in ways that are material, doesn't have to be financial. As I said in my talk, it doesn't have to be financial. And where the consumer couldn't avoid the harm and where there's no balance of you know, an improvement of competition or, or something that's beneficial to consumers writ large. The other thing that we do that the Euro Europeans don't do as much but want to start doing, and I believe if the reg is passed, we'll start doing, they don't do enforcement the way we do it. We really take enforcement seriously, not just at the federal level through us, and actually HHS does enforcement, FCC does some enforcement now on privacy involving common carriers, but also at the state level, there's a lot of enforcement there. The Europeans admire what we're doing on enforcement and are trying to think about how they can improve their enforcement mechanisms. So this is a very, we could have a day long conversation about kind of the, the differences between the US and EU law and the ways in which um, you know, some are better and some are worse. One of the things that I think is beneficial about uh, the way the framework for US law is we kind of have this gray area that allows for, I believe, innovation. I think companies in the US can innovate a little bit more freely. I don't want to make it sound like there isn't a lot of uh, technological innovation going on in Europe, because there is, and I saw some of that at CES, some companies doing some really interesting things. But I think it may happen a little bit more here because of this gray area where we, we're not saying something's prohibited, so companies move forward. But I think our enforcement work causes them and should cause them, one of the messages I want to give all of you is they should be thinking about the ways in which they could be harming consumers and could wind up in trouble if they aren't thinking carefully about their data use. Thank you. Sure. Terrific. We're going to take one question from that side, one question okay. from this side, and, and I'll we'll promise okay. we'll come back to the rest during our panel sessions. Okay. Gentlemen so, and I'll right. try to be a little bit briefer, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, my name is Cameron. I'm a student in the Masters of Privacy Engineering of Great. the current year. And I had a question about what your opinions were towards quantifying the damages of data breaches, because I understand it's very easy to see, okay, this much information was captured during a breach, but you, how do you really quantify that? And how do you go back to helping the consumer who was harmed? Because right now, it doesn't seem like lots of data breach legislation goes back to helping the individual who might be affected later, but mostly focuses on just the company that caused or that was affected by the data breach or was the victim of the data breach at that moment and making them rethink their security. Okay, so those are two really different questions. And I think one of the things we're gonna talk about on our panel is this issue of quantifying harms. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll, if you'll forgive me, because that's a really important question and I have a lot of thoughts about that, but I know our other professors want to jump in on that too. So I'll just postpone my answer on that and let's focus on the data security, data breach notification issue. You know, that law was developed in California. Now 47, 48 states have data breach notification law. The theory behind the law wasn't only to notify consumers about a breach so that they could take action to hopefully secure themselves, whether it's putting in two-step authentication, if it's you know, a breach that involves you know, their email and password, or whether it's um, putting a security freeze on their credit report so that consumers, so that no one could open up an account in their name easily. Security freezes are a very important tool that exists at the state level, not at the federal level yet. 
Um, so they are, these laws were designed in part to give consumers information so that they could take action. But they were also designed to, um, to, to give signals to companies that they should take steps so that they never have to engage in this breach notification in the first place. That is, before these laws existed, there might have been breaches going on, but nobody knew about it. In California, Jackie Speer, who's now in Congress, thought, well, if we require companies to, to notify consumers about their breaches, they're going to take steps up front to try to secure the data, make sure they're never a victim of a breach, so that they don't have to go through this public shaming process. So the law is designed to serve a couple of different purposes, not only to give consumers tools that they can, or, or information and, and in other places tools so that they can actually secure their information, but also it was the beginning of the conversation about incentivizing companies to really take security, data security seriously. I'm Deborah Todd, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Um, my question was, um, for companies who are in the Internet of Things sector, um, how much will it affect them financially to start implementing security measures early, and how will that affect startups? It's a great question. Um, you know, we, we do at um, the FTC talk about security as a scalable issue. Um, we do take into account, and this is like from a law enforcement perspective, but it's also from a best practices perspective. You know, if you're a two-man shop or two-gal shop in a garage somewhere, it's not, you're not going to have a chief privacy officer, right? Um, but what we do say is it's not, the issue is not just one of how many employees you have or how, how big you are um, or whether you're just starting out. Because you could be a really small firm and um, using and uh, collecting and generating really sensitive information. So it's an issue in part how big you are and what your resources are, but it's also in part an issue of what kind of data you're collecting and how much you're collecting and how sensitive it, it is. And so what we say is reasonable security is scalable. It's scalable based on all of these metrics. How big are you? What kind of data you're collecting? How sensitive it is? How much you have? And so if you're a really small shop, but you're dealing with some really sensitive stuff, you are going to have to treat, be more uh, protective of that information even though you're very small. So it's a, it's a matrix that we look at in terms of trying to figure out what is reasonable security and what are appropriate steps that ought to be taken, even for the small startups. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Barlim.